Hi, good afternoon to everyone. I think it's about time to start to move back to the spotlight of Afghanistan uh, this afternoon. So it's my, my name is Vigo Dasushatskas, and I'm a former EU ambassador to Afghanistan, and it's my great ple pleasure to, to chair, moderate today's uh, session uh, on Afghanistan. We have a, a group of four very prominent experts on Afghanistan, and I want to introduce you First of all, those who are online, I hope Michael McKinley is with us. And Michael McKinley is a non-resident senior advisor at the Center of Strategic and International Studies. He was a four-time US ambassador who also served in Afghanistan in 2014, 2016. We also have online Kate Clark. Uh, she's a former BBC journalist uh, who was stationed in Kabul already back in 1999 as a foreign correspondent. I had the pleasure to meet Kate uh, several, many times in, in Kabul during my term in, in office, 2010 to 2013. And uh, Kate is now uh, a co-director and senior analyst of Afghanistan Analyst uh, Network. We also have uh, John Manza, who is uh, Assistant Secretary General uh, of NATO for operations. And uh, as, he, uh, as he mentioned during our conversation before, the the session, he is now, I mean, he was also in, in, in Kabul, and we overlapped for some time as a deputy NATO senior uh, civilian representative in Afghanistan, and now he's leading a, a NATO lessons learned uh, exercise, which I hope you're gonna leak some of the, those le uh, lessons uh, to us and, and share, share with us. And last, but certainly not least, uh, we have with us Dr. Eleanor Zeno, uh, Eleanor is the Director of Regional Program Southwest Asia at Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And uh, she has a unique perspective from, uh, from, from the grassroots level, especially since uh, Eleanor was in, in Kabul until the very last days before, before the turnover on the 15th of August, August uh, took place. But let me, first of all, kick off um, on a current state of affairs as assessed by the Heart of Asia Society, uh, the Afghan international think tank on whose advisory board I'm, I'm uh, honored uh, to continue to serve. Uh, after 20 years of blood and, and treasure with and in Afghanistan, we are kind of back in a square one. Three trillion dollars spent, 241,000 people killed in Afghanistan and Pakistan since 2001. 7,455 military personnel and contractors of US and allies forces were killed in Afghanistan war. Uh, democratic government collapsed and major conflict ended in Afghanistan on 15th of August of this year when the Taliban literally unopposed came into Kabul. The chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff of US, General Mark Milley, uh, has told the Senate uh, of the United States on the 28th of September the following. The withdrawal from Afghanistan and the evacuation of Kabul was a logistical success, but a strategic failure. It is obvious the war in Afghanistan did not end on the terms we wanted. We must remember that the Taliban was and remains a terrorist organization, and they still have not broken ties with Al-Qaeda, end of the quote. Indeed, the Taliban now controls, I mean, more or less, the entire country. However, pockets of resistance remain, in addition to recent devastating attacks by Daesh on Shiite mosques and the Shiite communities in Kunduz and Kandahar. In fact, it seems that uh, the ultra-radical Islamic State Khorasan is challenging the Taliban, uh, embryonic rule by attacking its members and uh, fomenting chaos through large-scale attacks targeting civilians. Some 18 million Afghans are facing acute food shortages and are on the verge of starvation. UNDP estimates that the level of poverty will rise to above 90% by 2022. International aid has been virtually cut, and Afghanistan's 9.5 billion foreign reserves are frozen. Over 50% of Afghanistan's GDP and close to 75% of government revenue were financed through foreign aid. 
The Taliban, on its side, blames the United States and the international community for the economic meltdown, but do not take their share of responsibility for creating the conditions for the aid suspension. By taking the government by force, creating a non-representative, a non-inclusive government, and appointing a cabinet with over 20 UN-sanctioned individuals, the, the Taliban is penalizing entire Afghan nation. Despite the dire situation, at this point, there has been no mass refugee influx to Iran and Pakistan. On a positive note, the G20 group has agreed to work together to avoid a humanitarian disaster in Afghanistan, and the European Union alone pledged 1 billion euros. Assistance will be, will be provided in coordination with the Taliban regime, albeit not giving official recognition. And discussions, of course, continue under what conditions the Taliban regime may gain recognition. Secondly, while the military and other state institutions have crumbled, the investment in human resources will live on as a major legacy of the West. The Taliban will find it hard to crush the civil society and will not be able to ignore already changed mindset, including greater demand to respect women's rights. Even those who left the country will remain engaged and serve as a pressure on the Taliban to moderate and reform. And last, on the regional geopolitics, there are two trends emerging in the region with regards to Afghanistan. One is about influence seeking, notably Pakistan, but also China, Qatar, Turkey. Another, containment, which appears to be the strategy of Russia, Iran, and most Central Asian countries. As ever, there is no clear consensus on the future of Afghanistan. And as a result, it is likely that Afghanistan will remain unstable for the years to come. So with this, I want to turn into our panelists. And I mean, no wonder I'll start uh, with the NATO representative. John is, is, is indeed, I mean, what went wrong? <laughs> Why, after 20 years of blood and treasure, with the first objective to disrupt Al-Qaeda and remove Taliban, uh, being achieved in early 2002, what was wrong with the counterinsurgency doctrine, which seems to be failed? And what are the lessons learned from your perspective for NATO, uh, Afghan people, and the region? Over to you, and then we'll ask Kate and others to follow up. So I won't reveal any secrets. Uh, I really don't have to. You know, I've been visiting all the think tanks uh, over the last few weeks, and I think there's almost a consensus about your basic question of, of what went wrong. Um, and let me just hit a few of the, of the common ones, uh, and these are certainly part of our discussion at NATO headquarters. Um, first of all, when we start a, a campaign, as we did in Afghanistan, we really need a cold-hearted look at uh, determining how interested we are, what is the level of interest of the country that we're, we're gonna operate in. Um, you know, as a US political scientist, you know, we talk in terms of survival interest, vital interest, and peripheral interest. And some people get upset when I say this, but I would argue that Afghanistan was never in the vital interest of the United States or any of the allies. It was a peripheral interest. Um, and I would say it is still a peripheral interest uh, today. And this is important for democracies at war because if, if a campaign is not in the vital interest of your nation, you're almost guaranteed to not be able to sustain that campaign over a long period of time uh, because we're responsible uh, to our people uh, for the conduct of a campaign and the lives of treasure, as mentioned, that we might put into such a campaign. Um, what follows right after that too, though, is setting goals that uh, have to also equate to the level of interest and a realis realistic assessment of the absorptive capacity of the nation in, in question. Um, you have to understand the, uh, our counterparts in the host nation, what their motivation is. And I think we often get this wrong and we got it wrong in Afghanistan. You gotta look at some basic things like the level of education, uh, and certainly in a place like Afghanistan, there's not uh, what we would refer to as a maintenance culture. So when you talk about the type of uh, equipment uh, in military terms in particular that we would provide to Afghanistan, low levels of, of education and, and a, uh, a culture that doesn't 
uh, embrace maintenance uh, puts you on a bad footing right away. Um, there's a warning, I'd say, to future operations, uh, people leading future operations, about going too deep, um, being too ambitious in, in the use of coin strategy or nation building. Because if you're not careful, the sunk costs, the, the lives and treasure that you have invested in a place, they become so expansive, you, you've gone so deep, you've expended so many resources, that your ability to get out becomes extremely difficult. Because we're all uh, justifying to our populations, to our parliaments, how important the investment is. And then uh, after that investment has been made uh, without progress, you continue to, uh, to ask for more resources to protect the investment that, uh, that has been put in. So the sunk costs become the strategy, and that's a terrible way to make strategy. Um, sometimes we get in trouble too, I would say, with our own messaging. Um, you know, we say a lot of things publicly, um, both nations and um, uh, NAC statements, uh, for example, that, that talk about our goals, which are probably or were probably not realistic in Afghanistan. Goals on governance, on social development, on human rights uh, that were not likely achievable. But once you say those things publicly, you're further entrenching yourself in attempting to achieve those goals and it makes it harder uh, to get out of the, uh, of the situation. Um, I don't think NATO did a great job of staying in its lane in Afghanistan. You know, we, we talk about, about uh, a comprehensive approach and letting the UN and the EU and other organizations uh, do uh, what they should in their, their lanes and their level of, or their areas of expertise. Um, but NATO, by using the coin strategy, we were everywhere uh, at our peak. Uh, we had, uh, I had friends who were military officers who were helping the Afghans in farming. Um, we had you know, people uh, throughout their government as, as advisors, uh, really not in our defense capacity building uh, lane in, in particular. Um, and then we gotta be careful too about pushing our own social agenda on nations like Afghanistan. And I think the, maybe the hardest uh, lesson um, when it comes to social agendas was that we pushed the Afghans um, to adopt uh, a policy where 8% of their military and, and police forces would, would be comprised of, of women, but they were completely unprepared to do this. But to please us, as the host nation, uh, they recruited women and put them in places where they were unprotected and those women were, were badly abused as a, as a result of that. So, so we have to be uh, careful uh, in that lane uh, as well. Um, but not to talk too long, I would say that, you know, our influence in these failed, failing, and conflict-ridden states is much less than we think. And that advising efforts, um, mentoring efforts don't turn these societies uh, as we might think in capitals. Uh, it's, it's much more difficult than that. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna go down that road, well then it better be a place that is clearly in the vital interest of, of uh, our nations uh, and then we to stick with it. Um, but because Afghanistan wasn't in the vital interest um, we could not see it through for the long period of time that would be required in Afghanistan. Well, thank you very much, John. I would certainly, I mean, would like to come back to you on the vital interest issue, because if the Article 5 was invoked uh, 20 years ago, I think it meant it was a vital interest for NATO, US, and Europeans. But I mean, having said this, I mean, I would like to, to hear Kate's view. I mean, have we really been totally unrealistic and out of touch of the grassroots reality and what is tangible, what was tangible, uh, what was not. Kate, over to you. We, we can't hear you, Kate. You're muted, I guess. I think the main lesson is marry in haste, repent in leisure. Um, the US and then the US's partners went into Afghanistan hastily. They didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't know much about the country. If you read something like Bob Woodward's book, 
um, about going into Afghanistan, the scale of the ignorance is astonishing. Um, they worked with factions and commanders who had committed war crimes. Um, sure, toppling the Taliban was easy, but then what comes next? And I think there were you know, a, number of, a number of basic fundamental mistakes and misassumptions about Afghanistan which were made at that time. One of them, of course, was that there was a, a, an insurgency to counter after December 2001. There was very, very little fighting. The country welcomed the fall of the Taliban because people thought it meant the end of the long running civil war. The foreigners were welcome in 2001. And the idea um, that there was still this Taliban, remnants of the Taliban that wanted to fight the Americans was a mistake. What happened was that US forces and the CIA persecuted Taliban. The Taliban were not allowed to surrender. Remember Mullah Omar's um, offer was rejected in December 2001. Um, some Taliban wanted to set, set up a political party that wasn't allowed until 2005. Instead, there was this misassumption that there were remnants of the Taliban and there was a mass campaign of arbitrary arrest. Remember the use of torture, which included uh, CIA black sites, rendering people out of the country to Guantanamo. Maybe tens of thousands of Afghans were arbitrarily detained. We don't know. We only know the ones who, who, who made it to Guantanamo because of freedom of information requests that apply to America. Um, and what you had, of course, was that the, the, the new allies of the Americans were able to inform on their old enemies, tribal enemies, factional enemies, and get them arrested. So there were, there were and, and what was so cruel and so galling was that in those early years, you would speak to people who were desperately unhappy with what had happened. And they kept going to uh, then the, the, the leader, Hamid Karzai, and others at the said, will you please replace, for example, the police chief that's been looting the shopkeepers, looting people's homes. He's been persecuting his factional enemies. Will you please, he's, he's allies with the American troops. Will you please re replace him? And there was nothing. And eventually insurgency happened. And that happened across the country progressively. It was by no means inevitable. I would say it was stoked by very, very bad practices. Just a couple of other things. Um, the, the, I mean, the main early ISAF mission were the PRTs. Um, people welcomed the PRTs. These were the, the, the foreign contingents that were set up at the, at the provincial level. They thought that the foreign troops were going to protect them from the, cap the commanders that had seized power locally when the Taliban were swept from power. People thought that the foreign troops would protect them from these commanders, but largely they didn't. They allied themselves with the commanders for force protection reasons. So you had like, you had double trouble. And instead of, um, and then the, the, you know, the foreign forces would dig wells and build schools, which weren't really needed. What people wanted was basic security. The one exception for that was the, the British mission in, in, in Mazar and in the north, which did a really good job. They were not seen on, on telly with any of the three big leaders at that time, which was uh, Dostum, Mahakik and Atta. They, uh, they let the UN uh, do the political work. They let DFID, as it was, do the aid work and the NGOs. And they concentrated on security, on ensuring uh, at, at that time that that time uh, keeping the, the factions apart. That was the one, I would say, the one exception where NATO really made a difference. That stabilized, it concentrated on security and people security. Elsewhere it was pretty, I'm sorry, but it was pretty disastrous. And finally, the third thing I would say is the amount of money that poured into Afghanistan which enabled all the people that had seized power. And remember that first cabinet was two thirds, two thirds military men. Uh, the seizure of power across the country, provincial governors, district governors, generals, these were the old factions. They were not civilians, to a large extent, but they were enabled by the foreign money that came into the country to be financially autonomous from the people. And I think this was also one of the reasons why 
Afghanistan has failed because the, the, the government, the people who captured power, were never answerable to the people. And I see it as something like, you know, you, you have, say for example, you're a painter and you paint a picture and the perspective is wrong at the beginning. It doesn't matter how beautiful your colouring in is or your paintwork is, it's still fundamentally flawed. And I think we can trace that sort of thinking where the, for, you know, the foreigners came in and thought they knew Afghanistan better than Afghans. They allied themselves with people who were not answerable to the people. They enabled them to rule badly. They sabotaged the peace by persecuting people, not just Taliban, but whole tribes. And then they try and fix it with more money, more fighting. And always this sort of wishful thinking of, of what people thought they hoped Afghanistan was. And we saw that for 20 years, right up until the 14th of August. Well, Back thank you very much. In, in, uh, Riga. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Kate, for your very uh, honest and, and, and compelling remarks uh, and uh, lessons learned from your perspective, which we highly value, and I hope it will resonate into different, uh, different observations. But I mean, I would not, now like to, to, to switch to Eleanor, I mean, and if I may ask you, with your work and with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's work and many other NGOs on the ground, how it is seen from the Afghan perspective? Uh, what are the, how they describe the failure of the, of the Western mission? Thank you. Well, yes, I might say I, that I really agree with the two speakers that you just heard, and I will add maybe some more points from my observations living and working on the ground in Kabul in the last three years. So first of all, yes, I think that um, with regard to the nation-building component of the NATO mission, it largely failed due to unrealistic and um, high expectations, unrealistic goals, and, and goals that could have never been reached. And it had structural weaknesses. And one of the core structural weaknesses was that the international community in general invested in the wrong reform partners. So Kate already mentioned that we included former warlords that were also known for war crimes. And second also, the international community recruited reform partners from large parts from, for, of small liberal diaspora Afghan elites that had uh, two or three um, citizenships. And that was the main part um, why on uh, August 15, Kabul fell within a couple of hours because they had already negotiated their way out, because they had no roots and stakes in the country. And what is bitter for us for the international community is, is not that only the Taliban won militarily, but the bitter point is that they were also right, proved right in their political argumentation, because the Taliban have always argued that the government in Kabul is a puppet regime that will not sustain, that will fall the day that the international um, pulls out, and they were right in that. And that is the bitter point for us to learn. So what is the lesson learned for us now? And how could, have, could it have been different? So I think one of the main reform partners that we did not include in the 20 years of reform was the large religious conservative majority societies, which can be um, religious um, authorities, can be mullahs, can be imams, can be tribal elders. So these conservative people, average conservative people, they were not included in the reform process. And that's why women rights, freedoms, and um, human rights did not sustain and um, never gained the legitimacy within the broader society. So that was, I think, one main structural weakness of the last 20 years. And then second, yes, also, Kate also mentioned that um, the large international money poured in the country that created an aid economy, an economy that was completely dependent on incoming money and that created structures of corruption, of patronage. It also distorted the local labor markets. And um, last but not least, it also divided the Afghan society into people that had access to the international money and benefits and those that didn't. And um, these are the main structural weaknesses that I see. And um, um, I hope the way forward, I think that um, 
well, for in the moment, it, it doesn't look good the way it goes forward. But I think we are now at a very vulnerable point where we might try to negotiate some small red lines. So I'll finish with that point. Well, thank you, Eleanor. <coughs> May I turn now to, to Michael, please? And uh, at the same time, if, if you don't mind, I mean, uh, sharing your assessment on the lessons learned, addressing one of the questions uh, online, which uh, uh, reads the following, that the allies were present in, Af in, Afghan in Afghanistan for many years. How come there was no fundamental shift in, a, in approach to adapt to the ground reality and failures? That's a question which, I mean, uh, resonates what Kate and, and, and others have said. Michael, over to you. Welcome. So thank you very much. And uh, first, uh, let me say that um, I want to try to tailor my remarks uh, to the general themes of the conference, which um, focus on uh, Europe in a global, changing global context and new challenges which are surfacing. And your comment, for example, on uh, the debate over whether Afghanistan was a vital interest is a critical one because it's part of defining how NATO, how Europe, how the United States go forward from here on out. But I would also uh, like to echo the comments of uh, Kate and Eleanor and John. I think uh, what John opened with, that there is a wide consensus on what went wrong is absolutely uh, the case. And I think uh, Kate and Eleanor, if anything, are being polite about the failings of 20 years of international engagement. And what I would suggest there is that it wasn't just a lack of realism. It wasn't setting high expectations. It wasn't uh, misreading the combat uh, environment. It was an approach uh, which included strong components of an ideological drive after 9-11 by the United States to change Afghanistan, change societies, change Iraq, change the Middle East, and we acted accordingly as uh, we went forward. And uh, we militarized our response to nation building. Uh, there is no pride to be drawn from the PRTs or involving NATO or our military in civil reconstruction. As the record shows, uh, the engagement by our military in developmental efforts, confused issues, many cases belittled the efforts of civilian agencies, the UN, the EU, USAID, and didn't achieve much. Um, and as we proceeded, we lost sight of what we were there for. So NATO went in under Article 5, that's true, but it was to deal with a terrorist attack on the United States and Afghanistan being used as a safe haven by Al Qaeda. It did take 10 years to find bin Laden, but one of the reasons is we drew down our forces and decided to try to remake the Middle East with the invasion of Iraq. And so, but once we reached that point where bin Laden was actually killed in Pakistan, was that the moment when the United States and NATO should have reconsidered what they were doing in Afghanistan? Because nation building was not working uh, by that stage. But we uh, engaged in a very uh, significant counterinsurgency effort, which we misrepresented to ourselves year after year as succeeding building Afghan security forces. We overlooked the fact that we were working with warlords or allowing them to run their fiefdoms and regional uh, areas independently. And on assistance and on building out the government, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of what was done on developing education for girls, uh, freedoms for women, free press, some kind of representative government. But at the end of the day, we did not build governance. And again, to put it in terms of unrealistic expectations, we looked the other way. There was rampant corruption, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, year after year after year. And uh, what we saw in the final months in uh, Afghanistan um, is evidence of that. We've had the former Afghan finance minister, Payenda, beginning to detail just how bad it was. And we knew. And uh, what we did about it, I think, uh, still requires uh, a lot of uh, reckoning uh, going forward. 
And so it's no surprise there was a collapse, except it was a surprise. You take a look at NATO's summit declaration in June, paragraphs 18, 19, and there's the assumption that we're going to go on indefinitely building out the Afghan security forces, the government's going to work, nation building is going to function. And two months later, we have what we have. So as we look forward, I think there's a lot of internal reassessment that has to be carried out. NATO, I think, is in a great point now. I personally, when I was charge at our mission at the European Union in the early 2000s, thought building out a European pillar of defense was a good idea, independent of NATO. And that idea is coming back into vogue. Second, inside NATO, return to basics. Out of area was a mistake. And refocus on what the real challenges are, which is in the European context, dealing with Russia, dealing with the Mediterranean, dealing with counterterrorism in that region, dealing with migration questions, but focusing on issues that are much closer to home. And inside NATO, while accepting the United States is the leading player in NATO, accepting that there's other ways to look at things, other ways to define problems and not be carried away by pressures which negate a more analytical approach. And I would suggest we now have new challenges on the horizon, climate change, China, and so on. And hopefully there's going to be rethinking on this. But I will close by noting that the failures in Afghanistan are generational. They've had a tremendous impact because when you combine them with what was done in Iraq, it has undermined how the West mobilizes on security terms. It's time to regroup, focus on the bigger challenges, and have the humility to recognize that we did not achieve what we wanted to because we didn't approach it the right way. Well, thank you, Michael. After, after this, I mean, pretty, pretty, I mean, you know, uh, hard, hard heading, I mean, the assessments, one thing which I missed, and I'm surprised myself, I didn't hear word reconciliation. I didn't hear no one speak about negotiations with Taliban. Can I ask you, all of you, would you think things have been different if the United States would have entered negotiations with Taliban much earlier than in 2018. I remember vividly talking with late Richard uh, Dick Holbrook, who was, uh, I mean, who was trying to push uh, the chapter of negotiation with Taliban, but it, there was no support on, 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 on back in Washington, D.C. Do you think things would have different? John, what's your, what's your view? If negotiations would have started somewhere, when, if negotiations would have started when NATO and the United States were on the peak of perceived winning, 2010, 2012? Well, I think you know, a lot of people in Washington, uh, maybe Kate would agree with this, refer to this uh, original sin uh, where Mullah Omar wanted to, in effect, surrender. Um, and the US refused to take that surrender and, and bring them into the fold. And by rejecting them uh, in some ways, I think that sent them up into the hills um, to seek their political goals in a different way. Um, you know, but we held for many, many years to this idea of an Afghan-owned and led peace process. Um, I, I don't think we were there in, in the peak of our, uh, our military presence either. Um, you know, the, there's, we had talked about this a little earlier, you know, somewhat of an inverse relationship in the number of troops that we put on the ground and the, and the level of violence in the insurgency. So it wasn't exactly a, a strong correlation between putting more troops there and bringing peace. And I think the same thing is, is true probably in developmental aid. Money, more money poured in did not uh, necessarily result in, in better governance. Um, but, you know, I, I struggle with this issue of when the United States decided to negotiate directly uh, two years ago with the Taliban. Um, obviously, you know, we were all looking for uh, a, a way to end the conflict, um, but it was not an Afghan-owned and led process, which we had been saying for 17 years up to that, that point. Kate, can I ask you your opinion on this? Would have things be different if, if Americans uh, would, would, I mean, facilitated 
negotiations with Taliban early rather than back in 2018? I think 2002, 2003, just not persecuting Taliban would have been enough. They'd gone home, they were trying to live in peace. Um, most of the senior leaders had reached out to, to people that they knew on the other side amongst the victors. Some of them ended up in Guantanamo because they were double crossed. It was just, it was a sabotaging of the peace at that point. My first time that I suggested uh, talking to the Taliban was actually 2004. I met the then uh, uh, Rosamond uh, Marsden, who was coming out as British ambassador. And I felt very, uh, and I was working at the BBC at that point, so it felt a bit political, but it was a private chat and she was asking me what she should do. And I said, well, I think you should be talking to the Taliban. I think they need to come into the fold. They need to come into the political fold. And remember at that time, uh, Karzai was refusing to allow some of them to organize as a political party. He only allowed that in 2005 when it was too late. Absolutely at the time of the surge, that was absolutely the wrong decision to try and beat the Taliban into submission when actually what was needed was a, was a seat at the table. And then these last two years, what was Zalmay Khalilzad thinking about? <laughs> And when, when, the, you know, when the Soviets left, they built up the Najibullah regime. They didn't undermine it. They didn't work with the Mujahideen to boost their legitimacy. And I mean, basically, the, the US troops seemed to coordinate more with the, with the Taliban in leaving rather than the ANSF. Look at the way they left Bagram, you know, with a, electricity on a 20 minute timer. Look at the way that uh, because of Zell's fantastical reading of the peace process, the ANSF were put on, a, on a, a, an active defense stance, which meant that the Taliban were allowed to consolidate territory all the way through last year, while the ANSF were basically sitting ducks for them. I mean, the, the, I could go on, I won't do, yep. but, that, but the Khalizad strategy absolutely undermined the Republic and absolutely boosted the Taliban. And I, I, I think is one of the reasons why the Republic collapsed so very quickly. Michael, and your, your views, if I may ask? So I, I think the points that have been made by the two previous uh, speakers are spot on. My experience was with the peace process initiatives of 2015 and, uh, to 2016 and 2018 to 2019. And uh, I would suggest, as uh, Kate has mentioned, that the surge changed everything. And the Taliban survived the surge. This is something which uh, we really need to uh, sink into our heads. We didn't win with 130,000 troops on the ground. It was a stalemate. And the minute we began to draw down, by 2013, the Taliban was beginning to regain territory. In that context, the Taliban, by the time uh, there were outreaches in 2010 to 2012, 2015 to 2016, had already made a decision. Their primary goal was to reach power. They weren't interested in negotiating with the Afghan government, and uh, they were interested in feelers from the United States only insofar as it indicated an exit strategy. And so uh, I think as we call them a terrorist organization, uh, which they are, they're also a political and national organization with a level of support inside the country. And for too many years, uh, we, we sort of ignored that. And by the time we were ready to recognize it more seriously in 25, 15, 2016, uh, it was uh, uh, perhaps late for uh, entering into serious negotiations. I will close with one comment on the uh, agreement negotiated by Ambassador Kalazad. The reason, in my view, this was negotiated the way it was, was President Trump was threatening to pull out of Afghanistan from one month to the next from one three month period to the next before the November 2020 American elections. And uh, the US negotiators on the ground, which by the way, included General Miller of resolute support and members from the White House National Security Council were up against it in terms of trying to at least negotiate a time frame which would allow for orderly transition out and also a time frame for Afghan government uh, to uh, perhaps find a way to mobilize, to respond. Uh, I'm not saying there aren't uh, many mistakes in how that agreement was uh, finalized. What I am suggesting is we cannot ignore the political imperatives inside Washington, which limited the options for negotiators. Well, thank, thank you, Michael, for reminding that, that uh, political reality in the White House four or five years ago. But with this, 
with uh, withdrawal of uh, US and Western troops with uh, severely damaged reputation, what are the remaining possible roles for the West in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan as regional powers assume great responsibilities? May I turn to Eleanor, ask your views on this. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think our story with Afghanistan is not over, yep. but um, the story will be written or the script will be written by other actors in the future. Um, so we will become more of observers. And also because we don't have that, these vital interests as the regional countries have. So the regional countries are immediately affected in their security interests and their national interests um, of what happens in Afghanistan, be it um, terrorist groups, be it uh, drug trafficking, cross-border trade, cross-border uh, resource management, migration, etc. So for the future, I think, um, our stakes get less, also our, our um, tools to influence developments in Afghanistan gets less. And we have to think of um, on which regional actors we can um, build. And I think we have to put another lens on, on Afghanistan. So it has been a battlefield of the Cold War, a battlefield of the war on terror, and it will now soon become a battlefield of more of the US-Chinese uh, rivalry. And I think we have to look at Afghanistan through this perspective and then think of how we position ourselves and what to do out of this. And until now, I think it's still not clear of the foreign policy orientation of the new Taliban government. All Afghan governments in the past, be it in the monarchy, republic, secular, Mujahid or Taliban, they want um, diverse external relations in order to, to maintain their independence. What the Taliban can do, with, on whom they will bet, and with whom they will form alliances, I think it's still not clear, and we have to observe that. Yeah. Thank you. And of course, I mean, I mean the big question for, uh, for uh, local Afghans who are left in, in the country, or were forced to leave, is who's going to be the one, if at all, who will push for a more representative and inclusive government of Afghanistan? Who, who can help to protect minority and women's rights uh, and those gains which we achieved in education. And um, many of, of my, my interlocutors in Afghanistan still believe of a Western presence, a kind of Western presence. And they were very pleased to hear that EU is you know, committing one billion and, and, and other G20 as well. Do you see, uh, Kate, if I may ask you and, and, and John as well, do you see that United Nations can play a more prominent role in terms of uh, positioning itself as an interlocutor vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Taliban government, and then, I mean, you know, somehow coordinating the leverage which the West possess in terms of financial support? Uh, do you want me to answer that, or, or John, yes. do you want to go? Uh, okay, uh, both so you, for, I think for, the, um, um, I'm not sure that this is a stable government. It's very, very narrowly drawn, and the economy is dire. If you think about the amounts of money that have been supporting the Afghan state and the Afghan economy, uh, well, there was the spending by the military forces, foreign military forces, there was the support to the Afghan national security forces, less than that was the development aid and less than that was humanitarian aid. And it resulted, for example, Afghanistan imports, I think eight times more than it exports in terms of value. That's medicine, wheat, rice, fuel, electricity, base, absolutely basic goods. And especially with the, with the dollar supply frozen, the economy is horrible. And that's not just a humanitarian disaster. Uh, WFP have been talking about only one in 20 families have enough to eat every day. But it's an economic disaster. And I'm, I'm not sure that the Taliban fully realize the extent of what was lost when they took power. They're full of hubris at the moment, this God-given victory. I don't think they realize that the state is a very different beast from, from when they were fighting it. So I'm not sure that, you know, when we talk about going forward, I think we should bear in mind that it could get worse in there, it could get worse there. I mean, at best you would hope that, that pressure would mean that there would be a more representative government, a government that would be easier for the, for the foreign powers who have donor money 
to deal with with at least girls going to school at second, you know, something like secondary school education for girls should not be a problem for the Taliban. It's not Islamically banned. Um, should be prob should be uh, possible. I, not, I don't think they're uh, willing to make the concessions that would mean that the Western powers could 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 really work with them. And I, it, you know, it could get worse. It could get uh, resistance in various places or local commanders taking power. And we also see I, I, internal say, fighting say, and chance. It's a place to be watched over the next few years. And I'd, I, I'd say actually the way that the West and the people that took power t in 2001 behaved is exactly the same way that the Taliban are now behaving. Thinking that they have might, that they have this brilliant, and in their terms, a God-given victory. They can take revenge on their, their enemies. They don't have to bring people into the government that they don't like. It's asking for trouble. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Kate. Sorry, I mean, I'm okay. anxious also to invite, I mean, the questions from the audience. Uh, and before anyone, yes, I can see General Hodges, I mean, please. But I would be also, I mean, still would like to hear John and Michael at least brief views, I mean, or Eleanor, I mean, in terms of, is you, can UN play a certain role in the, in the months and years to come? Yes. Uh, Minister, thanks for letting me ask the question. Uh, the question will be to, to John, of course. You've got the task to lead this uh, after action lessons learned process uh, for our alliance. I was uh, Director of Operations in uh, Regional Command South in Kandahar from 2009 to 2010. And then I was the Director of the Pakistan-Afghanistan Coordination Cell on the Joint Staff in 2011. I made every mistake you could possibly make, uh, particularly as I look back now. Uh, I really believed in 2010 that we were winning um, November of 2010, uh, I had seen Afghan forces perform very well, and I didn't believe what I actually was seeing. I mean, I, I, thought, I thought we had the right model. I was completely wrong. And then on the, on the Joint Staff, I really believed that Pakistan was an ally or was at least helping, obviously, until, you know, Osama bin Laden is killed uh, in Pakistan. So uh, I can forgive people who made wrong assessments because I made multiple wrong assessments uh, myself. Uh, but I'm, I'm interested in um, the process of, of how, how you're going to, uh, how this is being done, what's going to come out. Will it be something that has sharp edges on it that actually will help us? I know if it's up to you, it will. Um, but that's what I would uh, certainly hope for um, as a result of the process. So very quickly, um, you know, the, the goal of this process is not to, to beat each other up. Uh, you know, I think everybody uh, uh, looks back now, uh, like my friend Ben, um, at mistakes that were made. But the most important thing is, is looking to the future. Uh, so, for example, we have this mission in Iraq that, that already encompasses many of the lessons from Afghanistan that were obvious when we put the... Uh, uh, the Iraq mission together at the time. It's a, it's a small footprint. Uh, we are staying in our lane. We're doing uh, capacity building with the Ministry of Defense, uh, with, the, with the Army. We're letting the EU work with the Ministry of Interior. The UN is working governance. Um, you know, we're staying out of governmental uh, affairs. And, uh, and, you know, it, the other thing I would say, and I've said this to allies many times, is Iraq is in the vital interest of Europeans. So um, we need to, we need to uh, make sure that we have a measurable impact in, in Iraq. Um, but to, to Ben's other point, you know, how are we gonna do this? Uh, we're bringing in a series of experts uh, every week and we started a few weeks ago. Uh, people who are being extremely honest, um, handling it in the deputies committee where really all the hard work is done at, uh, at NATO headquarters. Um, and it'll be perhaps a, a little edgier than most things that come out of NATO because we're not gonna agree this at 30. Uh, it will be a chairman's report um, uh, that I will write. But, but I'm, uh, I'm you know, very aware of the need to maintain alliance unity and look to the future. This isn't about punishing allies for things in the past. Thank you, John. Uh, any other questions from audience? Uh, in the meantime, if I may turn to Eleanor, I mean, you, you said, you said, which I fully agree with you, that, you know, Afghanistan's story is not over. I mean, we still have 40 million people. 
uh, installation in uh, in a extremely challenging challenging under extremely challenging circumstances. And uh, so, what what the West could do? Yes, and you also what the member yeah, states can do, yeah. what the UN can do. Yeah, you also ask what about the um, civilian engagement? And interestingly, I can say it from the part of the German government. Um, we are part of it. Our organization is part of it. And uh, in the moment we are, we, ha we are under we are under formation of a new German government, but still the rhetoric is that what I hear is that um, we want to continue the development cooperation to a certain extent, um, not from our part because we are a political organization, but they want to continue, and um, under certain conditions and still unclear. But I think one point which is important is that. Um, that there are some international organizations, particularly humanitarian, but also others, um, remain in the country as watchdogs. Even if they, they cannot do a lot, um, it should never be underestimated the presence of a single office, even if it's only one international person, it acts as a, as a, as a watchdog. And um, I think we need these little presences in order to also to take the Taliban by their words, at their words. Because they promise, they promise that they guard uh, human rights, the basic human rights, uh, how they interpret it. They promise that uh, girls can go to school if the conditions are ready, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have to watch it and take it at their words, and um, also give information out of the country. Because now they crack down on media, or media becomes um, in the focus and the target. So to get information out of the country. So that's why I find it important. Thank you, uh, Michael. Can I? invite you, I mean, to, 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 to give us a little bit of, of Washington or your personal uh, perspective, especially uh, since I quoted General Mark Milley, who said that we must remember that the Taliban was and remains a terrorist organization, and they still have not broken ties with Al-Qaeda. On the top of that, we see that IS uh, Khorasan is, is expanding and even challenging the Taliban regime. So what, what the United States and, and, uh, and NATO uh, should do uh, in order to avoid that Afghanistan doesn't become again the ungoverned space which would threaten American or allies' interests? So um, the first point I would make, and I'll try to make these in rapid succession, is um, we should not overestimate our influence or the importance of levers in changing Taliban behavior. And so the concept that UN declarations, assistance, pledges, diplomatic engagement, there have been a number of visits to Kabul to visit with senior Taliban leadership. We've seen the return visits uh, to Doha to meet with the deputy director of the CIA. We've seen visits to Moscow, to China. Uh, it doesn't follow that the Taliban has decided uh, to change its behavior. I agree with Kate that uh, it's a fragile government and it's making calculations on how to stay in power and what it needs to do to move forward. And that's where there may be some prospects for working with them going forward. I would note that what's more important is that Russia, China, Pakistan, the Gulf states, Turkey, none of them have recognized the Taliban government. And these will represent levers going forward that Muslim ministers from Indonesia and Turkey are planning visits or have visits to Kabul to try and influence how the Taliban approaches governance, that will be significant. We can overstate the impact of economic collapse. Uh, uh, if anybody wants to take a look at how long governments can stay in power with economic collapse, take a look at Syria and a uh, place where I worked uh, on for many years, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. Uh, we, we, we need, to, I think, to be realistic and hope that the Taliban are going to make a different calculation about what's good for them, what's good for the Afghan people. On the issue of terrorism and safe havens, um, I really think this argument has been overstated. Afghanistan is going to become a safe haven again for international terrorism and ungoverned space threaten the West. The biggest threats on terrorism to the West since 9-11 have been Islamic State. And uh, that was northern Iraq, northern Syria. They took over territorial control, established a caliphate, five million people under their control, required a military reaction. And no, they weren't inspired by the Taliban or Mullah Omar. And if we take a look at what's developing, whether it's al-Shabaab in Somalia, we take a look at the different uh, factions of 
Al Qaeda, Islamic State in North Africa, in the Sahel. None of it has anything to do with Afghanistan. So as we look at Afghanistan, we have already decided how we're responding to the broader threat in the Sahel, North Africa, in Yemen, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula, in northern Syria. Um, we don't have vast troop presences there. So unless people are arguing we should deploy thousands everywhere there's a terrorist threat, uh, we will be able to deal with Afghanistan. I would add that I think the Taliban is going to think long and hard about providing active support for Al Qaeda or other groups, um, particularly since some of its potential patrons like Russia and China are obsessed with Afghanistan not becoming again uh, ungoverned space uh, for international terrorism. And because Islamic State right now represents the biggest threat uh, to the Taliban, so it helps concentrate minds. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Just, I mean, to, uh, to strengthen and reiterate what you mentioned about the regional dynamics, and to step in uh, to an extent in defense of Zal Khalilzad, I mean, everyone made mistakes, no one is perfect, but I think what Zal has done, uh, and I admire uh, him for that, that he really made a real effort uh, in terms of building regional consensus. Yes, it was not ideal, but I mean, the fact by itself, as Michael has, has mentioned, that none of the neighboring countries and no one else has recognized yet Taliban is, a, uh, is, a, is, I would attribute to achievement of his efforts to have this quadrilateral, I mean, China, United States, and Russia, and, and, and also Europeans involved in building a regional consensus uh, with Pakistan and even on the occasions uh, Iran in, involved. Having said this, um, we have still, I mean, one minute and a half, and there were some questions about what U.S. wants from Europeans. But I mean, I would ask both Europeans and, and, and Americans, I mean, very briefly, I mean, what should Europeans draw as a conclusion of that? Should we be prepared more to take a great responsibility by ourselves as we see the United States retreat uh, from Afghanistan? And uh, someone mentioned about this uh, uh, European uh, European strategic autonomy, uh, will that be uh, impetus to that? John, what's your view? Well, I think the initial challenge is, um, you know, as Kate pointed out, how do we take care uh, of just the human needs of, of Afghan people? And, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, Europeans, uh, in particular in the EU, um, you know, we can hold a hard line on democracy and, and rights of women and whatnot. Um, but at some point, we've got to be pragmatic and make sure that this winter, uh, a lot of people don't starve in Afghanistan. So we've got to provide aid uh, to the Afghan people. So I'd love to see Europeans step up and, and ensure that, uh, that we're providing that aid uh, while we figure out what this Taliban government looks like in the future. Thank you very much. And with this, we are four seconds before ending of the section. I really want to thank, I mean, the, the panelists from, I don't know where Kate is from, London or elsewhere. Michael London. from United, London, London, Michael from, I guess, DC, and John and Eleanor from here. It, it is a, a difficult, if not painful, soul searching of all of us, especially those who spent uh, some time in Afghanistan. But I think it is, it is, a, it is a, a predicament and it's obligation for us not to abandon uh, 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 Afghanistan and uh, to try to, to find ways, whatever leverage we have, uh, to steer the Taliban towards a more human uh, and more uh, inclusive uh, governance and behavior. But thank you so much.